coming up on Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp. God sins in the middle of the Great Tribulation. I'm talking about in the heart of the Great Tribulation, God sends messengers of mercy. This is Bible Time. Welcome to Bible Time. Take your Bibles and open to the book of Revelation chapter 11. The trumpets have sounded, and now we're in the middle of the great tribulation period. Jesus told us it was coming. In the Gospel of Matthew, he took his disciples across the Kidron Valley from Mount Moriah, where the temple stood, and he sat on that mountain looking over that eastern valley, looking at Mount Moriah and the city of David to his left. And his disciples came to him and said, when shall all these things be? And what will be a sign of your coming? And then the third question, when will the end come? And the first thing Jesus talked about was deception. He said, you're going to hear all kinds of rumors. There's going to be false messiahs that are going to be raised up. They're going to make big claims. Listen to none of them. Why would he say that? Because they were about to go through the most excruciating period in their life when they're going to see the one who was sitting with them be falsely accused, put in a dungeon, scourged, mocked, laughed at, crowned with a crown of thorns, and taken outside of Jerusalem to a killing field, an old rock quarry, stripped, put on a cross naked for people to come by and mock him and ridicule him hanging in midair as though he were not fit for heaven or earth. And he knew that it was going to take his toll, so he said, be careful. But he said, some of you are going to be betrayed by your brothers and your sisters, your fathers and your mothers. You're going to be mocked and ridiculed for my name. But he said, we win in the end, and we do. You see, death cannot even harm the child of God. For the world, death is the end. That is, no more chances. Hell is sure. Judgment is there. Damnation is upon them. No time for repentance. But for those of us who are saved... Death is an echodos. It's an exodus. It is a way into the very presence of God and the glory that we will share with our risen Lord there. All of those who have gone before, who have walked with God, they will be there too to greet us. You say, well, we know them. Of course we'll know them, the Bible says. We will know and be known even as we are known here. And so all of that awaits us. Serve us forever with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But between now and then, there's coming a time on the earth that is unprecedented and unparalleled. That, that, that human descriptors fail as to how bad it's going to be. I once heard Billy Graham say that hell is going to be so much worse than what the Bible describes it because it is... It is limited. God has limited himself in the scriptures to human syllables and sentences. But he said, if that is true, and it is, then the same thing is true of heaven, how wonderful it's going to be. And so, the days are coming upon the earth when judgment is coming. Now, why would I say that in a time when people are needing encouragement? Because we need to know that God is faithful to his word and that's how we can be encouraged. 
But if God is faithful to his word concerning good things, he's also faithful to his word concerning those things that are going to have to do with judgment and justice. We hear a lot in our modern day parlance and vocabulary about justice, social justice. This one needs to be judged. That one needs to be judged. The one who has the final say is God himself. And his judgment is always accurate. It's always perfect. God, even in his anger, has perfect anger. God is not out of control. God doesn't lose his temper. God has controlled justice that brings about judgment. That's what the great tribulation is all about. Jesus called it the megale, the mega thlipsis. It's even hard for my palate to say thlipsis. But it is the, it's the word which means crushing. It's the word for a, uh, a mortar and a pestle that crushes and crushes and crushes. It's coming. The great crushing is coming. But in the midst of the great crushing, in the great breaking of the seals, in the midst of the great blowing of the trumpets, the woes, the woes, woe to you, Capernaum, woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, woe. It's the same sound in Hebrew or Greek. In Hebrew, it's the word, oi, oi. Oh, whoa, judgment's coming. But listen, in the middle of judgment and the justice and the wrath of God, there is mercy, mercy. God sends in the middle of the great tribulation. I'm talking about in the heart of the great tribulation, God sends messengers of mercy. Mercy. Now their message was repent. That is a message of mercy. That's not a message of judgment. It's only a message of judgment if you disregard it. The message of repentance is a message of hope. It's a message of God's tender love and care saying, I'll give you another chance, but you can't keep going the way that you're going. In this age of, of easy grace, in this age of, of everybody trying to make everybody feel good, we have left off the judgment of Almighty God. God's serious about this. Sin is what put Jesus on the cross. And so let's look at what God does in the middle of the blowing of the gray trumpet judgments. John said, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. And the angelos, the messenger, stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and, and those who worship there. In other words, take a measurement of all of this. But leave out the court which is outside the temple. That would have been the court of the Gentiles. And do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's three and a half years. That's half of seven years. That's half of the tribulation period. The Gentiles will be in control. And I will give power to my two martyreo, witnesses, martyrs. You see, a witness is someone who is a martyr. The Greek word for witness is martyr. You say, well, I thought that's someone who died for their faith. Exactly. That's what you did when you bore witness of Jesus in the early days. You see, we have so become soft and, and been coddled and cuddled to the point to where if somebody gives their life for Jesus, we think that that is greatly out of the ordinary. That was as common as rainwater in the first century. And so it came to be known if you were witnessing for Jesus, bearing witness of him, you were called by the name, the, the word for witness in Greek, Jesus said, you will be my martyrs. Now that doesn't mean that everyone was going to die. We have attached witnessing and martyrdom and death together. And so he said, I have two martyrs. I have two witnesses. I will give power to these two witnesses and they will preach. That's what you do when you prophesy. You preach. They're going to preach for 1,260 days and they're going to be clothed out of style. They're going to be in burlap. 
burlap is back. They're going to be dressed in clothes of judgment, of mourning, of sorrow, of weeping. You see, when, when something bad had occurred or was going to occur, you tore off your clothes and you put on sackcloth. Why? Because you were asking God for mercy to look upon your suffering and to remember you. These men were not counting for their own suffering, but for the suffering of the message they were bringing. That if the people did not repent, they would surely perish. By the way, hasn't this been the consistent message all the way from the beginning? You say, well, but, but we're, in, we're not under law, Pastor. We're not under the Tanakh. We're not under Torah. We're, we're in the age of grace. Well, would you say Jesus would be in that period? Would you, would you say John the Baptist would be in that period, the forerunner of Jesus? What about Paul, the disciple and the, and the follower of Jesus and the apostle who is known for introducing grace in the book of Romans as the epitome, the epitome, the, the volume, the key volume that is written, the book on grace. You think he would, he would know the proper message in this age of grace? Well, let's look at it. John the Baptist came preaching repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what John preached. Well, what about Jesus? Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Well, what about Peter? What about after the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost? Surely, surely that would be grace. Sirs, what must we do to be saved? Acts 2.37, Acts 2.38, Peter's reply reply is repent and every one of you who repent needs to be baptized that was after the coming of the holy spirit what about paul the apostle of grace when he brought the ephesian elders down to miletus that port city off the western coast of turkey he said after my departure, wolves will come in and they will try to destroy you. They'll try to take away from you the grace that I've given unto you. But I want you to know I'm free from the blood of all men. And then he told them why. Acts chapter 20, 20 and 21. For I ceased not day and night to preach unto you repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. These men were carrying on and will carry on. This is still to come. This is after the rapture of the church. This is after the Antichrist has, has taken over. God is going to have two faithful martyrs. Martyrell, witnesses, I witness, I share. And so they're going to be dressed in sackcloth. Why? Because of their message. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Have we ever seen lampstands and olive trees mentioned together? The answer is yes. It was during the days of Haggai and Zechariah before the second temple was being built and the people had grown lethargic. God's people had grown lethargic. Remember, you remember the story? You remember the story when, when God said through the king of Persia, King Cyrus, all of you folks can go back home, build a temple. I'll give you the money, I'll give you everything. Go build a temple and when you build that thing, remember me. Go back and worship your true God. He's the God of heaven. Worship him. So they came and they got it all together and they started their work, but opposition came. It always does. Opposition came. You know what they did? They quit. 
Jesus said a man has not thought it through if he puts his hand to the plow and looks back. If he starts building a tower and doesn't count the cost, everyone says he was a fool. But they quit. And for 14 years, the house of God lay in ruin. God sent two prophets, Haggai. Wow. What a prophet. I mean, you read those chapters. They're so short, three chapters. He said, you know why you got money trouble? You're robbing God. You're feathering your own nest while the house of God lies in ruins. You want to build your house and give the second best to God. God doesn't work that way. God doesn't need our leftovers. God doesn't need the leftover of your life, what's left of your day. God doesn't need the leftover of your money. Why, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills those cattle stand on. He doesn't need us. He lets us get in on it. And so then God sent Zechariah. What a prophet. Let's turn back there. Mark your place and turn back to Zechariah chapter 4. You see, in Revelation Chapter 11, all of a sudden, out of the blue, these two witnesses are referred to as the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Standing before the God of the earth. Standing in his presence. Zechariah says, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What do you see? And I said, I'm looking, and there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with the seven pipes to the seven lamps. Very descriptive. Two olive trees are by one on the right hand of the bowl, and the other is on its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked to me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And he said, No, Lord. So he answered and said unto me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, the one who was building the temple. It's not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, says the Lord. How do you build a life? Not by might, not by power, but by God's spirit. How do you build a family? Not by might, not by power, but by God's Spirit. How do you build a church? Not by might, not by power, not by marketing, not by slick brochures and all the paraphernalia, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Amen. The Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, and you shall become a plain? He shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also finish it. Then you will know, then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord which scan to and fro throughout all the whole earth. You know the only other time that phrase is mentioned is about God looking throughout the whole earth, looking for those in whom he can show himself strong and mighty. Now you know what that says? Please listen to me. God is looking for people just like you and just like me that are common everyday people that he can infuse himself into and empower us to do supernatural things. That's what he says. He's looking to and fro throughout all the earth. Then I answered, here it is. Then I answered and said to him, What are these two olive trees? At the right hand of the lamp stand on its left. And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the golden, two golden pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? You know what this, this messenger is saying. You ought to know this. What I'm telling you tonight, you ought to know. 
Now, we need to be reminded, but you ought to know, you ought to know that God's work can only be done God's way. We ought to all know that by now. Have we not tried it our way and it not worked? Do you not know what these are? And I said, no, nah, no, my Lord. And he said unto me, look at this. Here's the answer to who they are. These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. These are the ones that are in my presence. The word anointed one is the same word for Messiah. These are the ones that are anointed. They're the ones that are smeared. Now back to the book of Revelation. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. <laughs> wow. Uh, somebody comes up and says, I'm going to... <laughs> you wake up... <laughs> they speak and they're devoured. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in that same manner. These have the power, look at this, to shut up heaven so that it... No rain falls in the days of their prophecy. They have the power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all the plagues as often as they desire. And so people say, oh, I know who that is. It doesn't say who they are, but we know who they are because we know the one that could shut up the earth so it didn't rain for, that's Elijah. He never died. He's one of them because they've got to, they're going to die. And it's appointed unto man wants to die, so therefore it's got to be Elijah. And then it says, they have the power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues. <gasps> blood into water. <sighs> That's Moses. It's Moses. And he's going to strike the earth with plagues. That's Moses. Well, Moses died. Whoops. Oh, yeah, he did. Well, it, it doesn't say they died. It just says God buried him. Yeah, God opened up a grave and buried him alive. I mean, we've got to get a grip here. Okay, we may be just reaching just a little bit. I'm just trying to help you to understand. I know I'm being facetious. But this is important because people really get hung up on this and break fellowship almost over who these two are. And so the Scripture says when they finish their testimony, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them to overcome them and kill them. But here's what I want you to see in this passage. You need to take some kind of marker in verse 7, and it says when they finish their testimony. When they finish their testimony, highlight that, underline it, circle it. Now this is very, very instructive. What the construction of this particular sentence says is, They're going to work until they're finished. In other words, they're not going anywhere until God says they're going. It says, and when they finish their testimony, in other words, God said, I've put you on this earth to do something. All you need to do is walk with me, and nobody's going to harm you until I say they harm you. It's not over until I say it's over. Now, I want to tell you, this gives me great encouragement. If in the middle of the tribulation when people want to destroy and, and evil is unrestrained and the Spirit of God has, has taken away His restraining power and all hell literally is breaking loose on earth and God doesn't let these people be harmed or conquered until He says so, and he's only doing that so that he can do a greater miracle. That's encouraging to me. Because the Spirit of God lives in my heart. God has given me a mission. He's given you a mission. And what we need to do is walk with God and we'll be here till we're finished. Amen. You say, well, what about COVID? What about it? Well, what about, what about it? I hate what about isms because they leave out God. Hear me. 
It is my responsibility to be faithful to God. It is God's responsibility to protect me, to watch over me, to provide for me, because he will do his part. These two were not going anywhere until God says they're going somewhere. And even after they died, did you read the rest of this? Do it when you get home because we'll deal with it next week. If you are at home, read it right now. Because you see, even after death, it's not the end for the child of God. What's the worst thing that the devil can do to you in his mind? Is to take your life. What do you do with somebody whose life is Jesus? One example of, we have of that when, when asked that very question, when we get the insight into the mind of the Apostle Paul, he said to the church at Philippi, he was in jail when he said it. He said, for me to live is Messiah. To die is gain. Now, if I stay, that's better for you. If I go, that's better for me. What do you do with somebody like that? I mean, can you imagine Caesar and all of those guards saying, well, you do that and we'll kill you. He'll say, well, that'd be better for me. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, then, if that's what you want to do, we're going to stay here. You're going to stay here with us. Good, that's better for you. How do you torture and torment somebody like that? You know what he said to the Galatians? He said, I bear in my body the ta stigmata, the brand marks of Jesus. He said, I've been whipped. I've been beaten. I've been stoned and left for dead. I've been shipwrecked. And he named off a dozen things. And he said, those are my marks of identification of my loyalty to Jesus. Let no man hinder me, for I bear in my body the brand marks. I belong to him. Do you belong to him? Thank you for watching Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp. We hope that the Spirit of God has touched you through Tony's message and that your knowledge of the Bible continues to grow. As you study the truth of the Bible and you feel you do not fully understand what it means to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, we would like to help you. Contact us today at TonyCrisp.org and we will send you this free booklet, How to Know God in a Personal Way. This resource will help answer your questions about how you can begin your journey as a follower of Jesus. Bible Time with Dr. Tony Crisp is made possible because of your prayers and generous financial support. If you feel God is leading you to contribute to this ministry, you can easily give online at tonycrisp.org donate. Or you can send your gift to P.O. Box 6596, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37914. A gift in any amount is appreciated. No gift is too small, and there's no gift too large that can be used to God's highest purpose. Thank you.